And now I invite Mr. Shane John to deliver the opening remarks. It is in times like these where young people are called forward to lend their voices to change, and we take up that opportunity. Good morning, friends, young people of Trinidad. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this morning and allow me to recognize some very important persons that are here this morning. Chairman of the National Chairman of the Committee Responsible for Constitution Reform, Mr. Berendra Sinanan SC, Dr. Terence Farrell, Committee Member of the Committee, Dr. Alicia Roberts, Dean, Faculty, Law, University of the West Indies, Ms. Chantal LaRoche, Attorney at Law, Mr. Keel Tiloxing, Attorney at Law, members of the Executive of the Trinidad Youth Council, members of the media, and most importantly, those of you who have joined us this morning, the young people in your numbers. I hope that as the day continues, those young people that are not here will join us very soon. But this morning, it's very important that we are here. And I firstly want to say a very special thank you to the committee responsible for constitution reform, and all its members of the Constitution Reform Committee for choosing young people to be a focal point. And I can also boast to say that we are the first civil society group or bracket that the committee has engaged. The committee has been engaging in many consultations across Trinidad and Tobago, in fact, this very said venue that we are in was once a consultation uh, hub or space for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But now this morning, here in San Fernando, we are conversation. We are joined together to have a conversation with the young people, members of the council, and you know your good selves, the young people that have brought and turned out here this morning. Uh, just quickly. In coming here this morning, one of the things that dawned on me, and I just want to share, that the British Youth Council, which was established many, many years ago, actually earlier on in this year, there was an announcement that the British Youth Council in Britain, in London, they would no longer be funding that initiative, which is the government, and there would be a move to close the British Youth Council. And that, it would impact thousands and the lives of thousands of young people who actively lobby within that jurisdiction through the British Youth Council. I say that to say that this morning it is very important for you that the Trinidad Youth Council has been chosen by the committee to advocate as well as sit with members of the committee. I want to know this morning that this setup is definitely different to all the other setups that has been initiated by the committee, and that has been done purposefully. You see, for those who are here, um, I want to share with you, it is important when we begin these discussions, let your thoughts, your knowledge, and your understanding of what the Constitution is come out and share with the committee. But not only that, it matters not if you are a legal student or if you are an attorney. While I must boast that the council has quite a few attorneys, I myself I'm studying law and I have the good fortune of working in a public sector and public space environment. But it matters not any of those things. What is important this morning, and I will ask of those that are present, take the opportunity, one, to understand what the Constitution is, and two, share your thoughts and your ideas. And I want to encourage you 
to openly share your thoughts and ideas. And I'll close by saying, and my first submission, I will hope for constitution reform that there is a section that deals specifically with youth and young persons. Yesterday I had the good fortune there was a delegation visiting Trinidad and Tobago from the UAE. And in fact, in 2019 or 2018, there about, there was a Minister of State in the office of the Prime Minister in UAE. And she was appointed at just the age of 25 with, responsibili with responsibility for youth development in UAE. The UAE, as most of you all should know, that COP28 was held in Dubai, and she was the climate lead focal point, and she's now 31 years of age. One of the things that I would like to see in the Constitution is focus on a National Youth Council and understanding the parameters of how we as a youth council and young people can contribute to the frameworks and the development of policy. There are several countries, Dubai, Finland, Singapore, that focuses on having a national youth council or youth advisors in some instances that impact policy and also advise the government on policy. And like in Dubai, there is a seven-person national advisory body that is enshrined within the constitution that focuses on youth advisory. So, of course, this morning is not about me, but it's about all of us who are gathered here to share your thoughts. I want to say thank you very much to all of you young people who are here this morning to start the conversation. And this is just the start of a, a journey, and a journey bigger than us. And I would encourage you to encourage your peers to share your thoughts, your ideas, and your initiatives if they are not here today. Share it in writing with the committee. There is a lot, lots to discuss, and I want to again thank the committee led by Mr. Sinanam. I want to thank my members of the council. This project was initiated in under two weeks, and it has been a journey, and it, we can only go up from here, and I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this morning, and do enjoy the rest of your day, and of course, feel free to share your thoughts with the members of the committee. And again, I thank you. Okay, so quite the high difference here. So after those riveting words from Mr. Shane John, I now invite Barindra Sinanan, SC, to do an introduction from the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, the chairman of the committee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first introduce you to my entire committee. To, on the table right in front of you is Dr. Terence Farrell. Proceeding left would be Ms. Jackie Samuel Miguel. Then we have uh, Mrs. Helen Drayton, Mr. Ray Sandy, and Mr. Winston Rudder. Not with us today is Heyman Arain Singh, who is out of the country, and Mr. Nizam Mohammed, who may yet turn up. I'm not quite sure. 62 years ago, our first Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, said, the future of the nation lies in the handbags of the, of the children. And that is still true today. It is the young people who must energize the powers that be and demand change. The Constitution does need changing. But the voice of the young people would be the catalyst for change. So this forum today and the other two to follow, which would be in Port of Spain and Tobago, we are hoping that the voices of the young people would be heard, we want you to come out, express your views, 
and ultimately participate in the conference that will be had in the future, in the near future, and let your voices be heard. This morning, we are extremely fortunate to have with us the Honorable Mr. Justice Westman James. We also have Dr. Alicia Elias Roberts. We have Chantal LaRouche, and we have Mr. Kyle Taklal Singh, all of whom will be participating in this morning's proceedings, and all of whom will share their experiences and information which will benefit this, uh, these proceedings. So, it's not about me or our committee, today is about you. So, without further ado, I will close and await the participation of the young people through the Trinidad Youth Council. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Sinanan. I just want to take this opportunity to recognize Justice James, who has joined us this morning and will be conducting a session that is upcoming. So after all of that discussion and all of that background, what we'll do now is invite one of the committee members to discuss the purpose of this exercise and essentially why your role is so important today. So I invite Dr. Terence Farrell to speak on that matter. And while he comes up, I would just like to advise you all that the bathrooms are to the right. So when you exit, James, we are grateful for breaking down the important elements of our constitution. So what we're going to do now, we're going to become a little more informal. And so with that, I am now inviting Dr. Terence Farrell, yes, who would be, yes, who would be sharing on the purpose of this constitutional reform exercise. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I just, I just have a, a, f a few points to make, and, and, and hopefully they will not be too controversial, as I, as I tend to be sometimes. Um, first is that the constitution that we now have, which is from 1976, is a colonial constitution. The constitution we have now created us as a republic, gave us a president instead of a governor general. It did some other things, distributed some powers from the Governor General or the, or the, or the Prime Minister to the, to the President, but it is pretty much the same constitution we had from 1962, the Independence Constitution. And that constitution was given to us by the British. So we are operating in 2024. Your constitution in 2024 is a colonial constitution given to you by the British. The second point is, so therefore it's not yours. And it's very clear from the preamble that you have, because as Dr. Roberts pointed out, constitutions elsewhere start off with we, the people, our constitution. We say these things. Ours doesn't say that. It's written in the third person. It says, whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So it was clearly written by somebody else for you. We have to change that. So if there's nothing else that changes in this constitution, it has to be the first, very first words of the constitution. The Guyanese constitution starts off, which they've just done, with the words, we the people of Guyana. We can have a constitution that is given to us by the British with institutions, by the way, we talk about the distribution of power in the state among the institutions. And some of those institutions, like the service commissions, date back to the 1950s. And even the British and the other Commonwealth countries, which had those institutions, have long since departed from them. And we continue to try to operate those institutions here in Trinidad and Tobago today, with the kinds of consequences that we are seeing. So the Constitution is not working very well. Many of the controversies that we see in the papers every day between commissioner of police to be appointed and auditor general and the attorney general and so on and so forth, these controversies and conflicts 
don't have to do necessarily with the people who hold the office. It has to do with the fact that the, in the offices that they are trying to operate are deeply flawed institutions. And that's why the conflicts occur. We've got to fix the institutions. They are not working well. The other point I want to make is that this is the fifth time that we are trying to fix the thing. This is the fifth time we in Trinidad and Tobago are trying to fix this constitution that we've had. And every administration has tried to do it. NAR has tried to do it. The UNC has tried to do it. The PNM has tried to do it. Oh, everybody has tried to do it. So it's not a party thing. Every administration has recognized that the thing needs fixing. Because it's not a party thing. It's a we thing. And the thing that we have as this constitution is not working for us. And we've got to try and find a way on this occasion to make it, to change it. And let me give you an example because many of you here are under 34 years old, I'm quite sure. But on July the 27th, 1990, 110, 120 guys went into the Red House and TTT. TTT was the only television station at the time. They went into the Red House and they decapitated the state. Why? Because the legislature and the judiciary on a Friday afternoon in the parliament are sitting down in the same place. The whole of the executive and the parliament, the legislature, are sitting in the same place on a Friday evening in Trinidad and Tobago. And so they went in there and they decapitated the state of Trinidad and Tobago for five days. And we were very fortunate that the regiment was able to step in and to deal with that situation. I must go back and look at that history because, and that is in the Constitution, because the Constitution structured the thing that way. It made it that way. And we've got to fix it. And there are many other things in the Constitution that we need to fix, Mr. Uh, Justice James, uh, uh, I mentioned, that need to be fixed. And it has nothing to do with political party, it has nothing to do with religion, it has nothing to do with ethnicity, it has to do with the fact that the institutions as designed and as represented in that book in front of you are simply not working for us. So please, turn your minds to the exercise today because it is your future, as we say, it is your future, it is going to be your constitution and therefore it is your voice that is going to have to make the difference to what we do, to what happens to you in the future. So that, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Farrell, for that riveting discussion and sharing on the purpose of the Constitution. Jeremiah? Oh, testing, testing, lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, so before we move on to the next part of this morning's program, we just want to do a quick recap. Dr. Elias Roberts guided us through some of the basics of our Constitution. She put into perspective, she put into perspective who are the authors of our Constitution and why is it necessary to have a written Constitution as a relatively young sovereign states. Also, she encouraged us to look at the electoral processes of our Constitution and to refer to other sovereign states who have embarked on the journey of reforming their own constitutions. We had Justice James, who gave us food for thought. I don't know about you, but my plate was overflowing. He asked us, what do we want? Encouraging us to look at the options that are currently on our global landscape, whether it's parliament, sorry, whether it's past the poll system or a proportional representative system, single party or coalition governments. Further, he encouraged us to give consideration to what do our fundamental rights and freedoms truly mean to us. From the youth perspective, he encouraged us to contemplate how do we want this document to define us? 
and then we welcome the enthusiastic Dr. Farrell, who gave us a bit of a historical lesson from colonialism to our country's coup to present date and the valiant attempts of previous administrations to reform our constitution. Overall, overall, we appreciate the need that constitutional reform is, or is or should be high on the priority of tasks to execute. And now we gather here to utilize our youth voices to illuminate this in our country's context. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that as we continue into the next task on this program that you engage our guest speaker on the next program initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jemaya, for that recap. So I think what we under... Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. So right before we move on to Ms. Shanta LaRoche, I think it's very clear that we understand in this session that this constitution is ours. And the purpose of this discussion is for your voices to be heard. Yes, you've gotten context. Yes, you've gotten background. But we are coming up to the point of the discussion where you begin to contribute and you begin to see that discussion take place. So now what I'd like to do is invite Ms. Chantal LaRoche, who is the Director of Legal Services at the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, an attorney at law all around boss to me. I invite you up to the stage. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Terry, you're going to make Ms. Samson tease me. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and good morning to Jeff. Hello? Yes. Chris, Kendall, Shane, right? So the people whose names I know of, obviously, I'm going to pick on you guys, right? So this segment is going to be quick and hopefully fun. It's a quiz. So all of you who are involved in youth advocacy, you want your voices out there, you're on TTT, this one was on 91.1 yesterday with this one. We want to test to see what you know about your constitution. Yes, great. Huh? Are there, are there points? If it's an oral quiz, no, you, know, you don't get to use your books. That's what you're going to try to do? Okay, great. But you could, you could look in your book. It's an open book exam. Right. Everybody ready? You have your constitutions out and ready. Okay, first question is an easy one. What are the qualifications for becoming a senator? It's easy. Yeah. You have, you have to be 25 years. You have to be 25 years old. appointed by a political party or the president. What's the composition of the Senate? The Senate right now. So I think it's 16 government senators. Yes. Six opposition. Hmm. And eight, nine, <laughs> independent. Thanks for helping him out there, Terry. All right, good job. Do you, bonus points if you know which section of the Constitution that is. 40, 40. Come on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hello. How are you? What's your name? Hi, Fano. Part one. She gave us chapter and part, all right. It's section 47 too, right? Wonderful. Good job, Chris. Thanks for starting me off on a good note. I'm going to do now is the icebreaker exercise. So the first thing that we asked you all to do, which was to write what the Constitution means to you, what we'll do now is, I'm sure everybody has had an opportunity to write their thoughts on that. Yes? I'm hoping so. Okay, so what we'll do now, this is the interactive part. So, I mean, if you feel a bit shy and you feel a bit timid, this is the time to break a bit out of that, right? So, let me just shift from where I am. Morning, everyone. Shalisha Samuel here. Um, I'm secretary of the committee. What I'm going to do now, all of these would have been your thoughts on what the Constitution means to me. I'm going to hand them back to you. They're not going to be the one that you wrote. You're going to read it out loud, 
And once it sounds familiar, if it is something that you would have written, you would stand and introduce yourself and stand next to the individual who read it out. All clear? Perfect. The answer in front of me, as a democratic society, a constitution plays a crucial part of every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. This means we as a people have a voice to impart change, let our, let our views be heard, and make a positive impact for change and how we want things to be governed. Does this sound familiar to anyone? If it does, please raise your hand. Ah. So now I'm going to introduce myself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Fana Nelson. It's nice to be here as well. Thanks. What I have? Sure. As we know, the Constitution is basically a set of rules that is used to govern a country. Therefore, the Constitution will be of critical importance to me as it will guide me to my rights as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. As a young person, I would really like to understand the constitution of my country. Does it sound familiar to anyone? Yes, yeah, so who is the one? Oh, right. Hi, my name is Aliyah Book. The Constitution is a living, breathing organism that reflects the values and norms of a society. Thank you. Okay, living and breathing. Okay, who wrote that? That is actually mine, so we're oh. going to choose another random person. Okay. <laughs> Anyone at this table willing to share? They have the rights and freedoms that I have as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. The guidelines in place that allow our society to function presently, lawfully, and orderly, and I give to the future generations. Oh, my name is Richard Campbell. Thank you very much. So, I have uh, this is the governing framework that a country follows. It focuses on the three governing bodies judiciary, legislative, executive. Oh, uh -huh, you don't have one chain. Okay. Stand, reintroduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Shane John. Uh, it is. <laughs> it's simply the rules and the regulations. There was a word before, but I'll just gloss over that. It's simply the rules and regulations which govern how our country should be run which is critical to our society, as without it, the Constitution assures there's a rule book which guides certain aspects of our government. Yes, so who wrote that? All right. Um, hi, I'm Josiah Dolphus again. The Constitution acts as a... As... Uh, Oh yes, the Constitution acts as a set rules and guidelines that govern our nation. Thank you, Giuseppe. Good morning, everybody. My name is Atiba Morris, and this card reads, the Constitution is a legal handbook in which our country and its operations are guided by. Does that sound familiar? Thank you, Atiba. Okay. So it seems that we have people behind the scenes participating, which is always good. So I have a right up here, so I'll fill in for Christian. So what does the Constitution mean to me? The Constitution is more like the backbone of Trinidad and Tobago. This is what allows Trinidad and Tobago to continue on its already great path towards greatness. The Constitution allows us, allows laws to be passed and 
cases to be dismissed under the overview of the Constitution. The Constitution defines, listen, this handwriting is beautiful and not a custom, <laughs> right? Defines us as a nation and it is what makes us Trinbagonian. Okay, who wrote this? The, all right, ah, well, okay, 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 okay. Well, we, we, you went already, but I mean, went this already. was. You wrote this? Your handwriting is much better than mine. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go on to a random table and ask them to take over from here. I've arrived there. Hi. I'm Tishara Glasgow. The Constitution is the principles that govern the manner in which any primary political power may serve under jurisdiction of... Sound familiar to anyone? Okay, so now we're going to pass the mic to one other person at the table. Introduce yourself and read what's on your card. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ranella. Ranella Stewart. It is the law on how. It is the law on how the country needs to be governed. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It is the law on how the country needs to be governed. Does it sound familiar? Oh, it was it was ah. okay. okay, so let's move on to another table. <laughs> Hi. My name is Latoya Lamont. What does the Constitution mean to me? The rights and laws that protect and serve my well-being. Hi, my name is Brianna Atwell once more. What does the Constitution mean to me? It's the supreme law of the land. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Batiste. Um, what does the Constitution mean to me? My opinion of the Constitution represents a wealth of resources that should be regularly revised to ensure equality throughout society's borders. Hi, good morning. I'm Kiron Kanayo. Um, what does the Constitution mean to me? To me, the Constitution stands for the highest law in the country. It should be, it should prevent segregation and bias. I don't understand that part. Um, it, gives, it gives the rules and regulations of the country that citizens abide by to ensure fairness, equality, and justice for all. Hello, my name is Anarian Mason, and what does the Constitution mean to me? Sets out the rights and freedom that are allocated to each person. It also gives guidance on how the country is supposed to be run. For example, the Constitution differentiates the process amongst the executive, legislative, judicial functions. It executes it ensures that no one body has more responsibility than others. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Nafisa. So this card reads, The Constitution is a set of laws that applies to everyone in the country who are considered citizens of the country. The Constitution means that you, as a citizen, have rights irregardless of your ethnicity, culture, or your financial status. It means that you are allowed to live and be protected. Is that anyone? Okay, well, great. I think we would have ideally gotten through everyone, save for the new person, and I have that last card here. So, the Constitution governs rules and laws which impact the lives of citizens, which guides with guidelines by which we follow. So now that we have listened to all of your initial thoughts on the Constitution, what we're going to do now is invite Dr. Elias Roberts, Dean of the Faculty of Law, to give us some background or to break down the process 
on what the Constitution is. Welcome so, Dr. Abbas, we welcome you. It's important to participate in the principles that are essential to every citizen, regardless of age. If you look in the preamble of the document, so before we get to the substantive provisions, so pages 12 and 13, you see, whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that refers to authorship. In other Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions that have written constitutions, some may say, we the people, referring to the authors being the people. So this consultative process is very important that the final document represents, you know, from the consultation, what the drafters will put together. You're the authors of the constitution. And in the preamble, so the parts that come before you have section one would be aspirational values. So if you actually take a minute and look at that, what comes after, whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago, you see A, B, C, D, reference to various principles, acknowledgement, the supremacy of God, faith in fundamental human rights and freedom. You see reference to principles of social justice, belief in a democratic society. So various aspirational principles, if you take your time just to look at page 12 of this document, you see there reference to aspirational principles and the authorship. Going across to the sections now, you see a reference to the supremacy of the Constitution on the section two, right, on page 13. So I was told it would be high school students and given a basic breakdown. So for the attorneys, forgive me. For the judges, forgive me that you already, you're familiar with this. But I'm just breaking it down to the very basic level that I was asked to break down the, um, the constitutional fundamentals and principles. And you see reference to the Constitution is the supreme law of Trinidad and Tobago. And any other law that is inconsistent with this Constitution is void to the extent of the inconsistency. So we have there a written document, written by the people, and it's supreme. And those are fundamental and basic things that you should know about the Constitution. So it's the highest level of authority in the country. Why do you think there was a need to have a written Constitution in many of the former colonial territories? Because in the UK, so we're, we have what they call Westminster-style constitutions, right? They're written and supreme. In the UK, you can't look to one document and say, this is a constitution of the United Kingdom that is written and supreme. So if you look at the table of contents and what it covers, right? So it talks about the composition of parliament, President, citizenship, fundamental rights and freedom, judiciary. So various arms of government, you will find that the Constitution outlines the structures of the various important arms of government. These are sometimes referred to as constitutional office holders that it's not an ordinary act of parliament that might deal with the appointment of this person and how they can be removed and their functions, but rather it's in the supreme law, higher than any other law, and also when it comes to changing that law, various sections may be what you call entrenched and not easy to amend. So you have to go through sometimes a referendum. There are various sections that in different styles of constitutions, their differences with different sections. So not all of the Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions obviously have constitutions that are copy and print and mirror each other. Also, some jurisdictions have went ahead and reformed their constitutions. So some constitutions may make reference to environmental protection, protection of nature. Others may not because when they were handed down, they didn't think that that was something important to include at that time. Some constitutions may have reference to indigenous rights. So some things that as you evolve as a society and you look at your constitution and you believe that you want this to be included there, 
it is a good exercise also in terms of reform to look at what others who have reformed their constitutions, the changes that they have made. Look at your system of elections. The, the type of system that you have, it can vary, vary from country to country. Is that serving your purposes well? Is, is there time for reform? So we have to listen to the people, get the feedback, look at what others have done. So you can always learn from other territories, learn from their mistakes, learn from their successes, and then make an informed decision to be part of that process to say, I think this could really work well in this jurisdiction. So I would think that that should be the idea, that you look at the content of the actual document and what is prescribed therein as your supreme law. So I just have 10 minutes. I don't have time to go through all of the sections on the various rights and freedoms. The Constitution generally protects fundamental rights and freedoms, the various arms of government and to keep them separate and, and what their functions are, how persons are appointed, how they can be removed. The amendment process is included therein. Values. The structure of your judiciary. I have my own pet peeve with the appeals to the Privy Council. <laughs> as a final appeal rather than the Caribbean Court of Justice. So those are major issues that as a people, you have to decide. You consult with the people. Is this still working well? Do you have all the information at hand to retain this as is? Or do you think there's time for a change and give your feedback? So as you look at the provisions, there's some that you may want to pay particular attention to. The sections on the fundamental rights and freedoms, the sections dealing with the various arms of government, the powers of the president, the prime minister, the executive arms, the judicial arms, parliament, the amendment procedures, the elections, process. Right. I'm Guyanese, I'm from Guyana, and after every major election in the past oh, 10 years, there have been cases coming out from that process about the powers of the chief elections officer, the whole procedure, if it was fair, if it's corrupt. And everybody becomes a constitutional expert. Then they go into the constitution to see what does it say in terms of the chairman and the appointment and at which point this should be done. How is this process working? Appeals, appeals, review of the process. It becomes quite contentious. Because you want to have a document that is clear and fair that you can have a smooth transition of government. That you agree upon a process People vote, exercise their rights, and at the end of that process, there should be a smooth transition. I think that's, a, for me, my perspective, that would be evidence of a mature democracy where you respect the decision, the vote, and the will of the people. That the people, you ought to the Constitution, you agree in this process, and then this is the will that you voted, and at the ballot, you clearly indicated this is the winner and then that should be accepted and there should be a smooth transition because if you don't have important rules and guidelines set out within this document, it can lead to chaos, problems, strife. Because if it's not clearly outlined and the courts cannot then interpret what does this mean, then people might be swayed that I'll go and riot and fight because it's not clearly delineated in the Constitution. It can't be clearly interpreted. What does this mean? And to accept this, that we the people, we have agreed that this is how this law should be interpreted. And the courts play an important role. There's an old case, Marbury and Madison from the United States, that says that the judges, the judiciary, they're the guardians of the Constitution. That if the Constitution is a supreme law, and there are laws that are inconsistent, 
to the extent of the inconsistency, the courts can then declare them to be void. And the courts play that role of interpreting where there are disputes, problems about whether you have acted outside of your powers, if there's a constitutional office holder that might have acted in excess of powers, abuse of powers, the courts have an important role. Right, so I'll end there. And overall saying that the Constitution provides important principles for governance, establishing rules by which the society operates. They reflect the collective will and aspirations of the people. They can serve as a cornerstone of democracy, ensuring that your government power is exercised in accordance with established principles and values. Right, and I asked a question earlier that answer the question that why did we need these written documents? Because it's new, free countries in that embryonic stage of your establishment, sovereign entities, it is important to have something written supreme and clearly outlining the arms of government versus the UK that can look back to hundreds of years and say, these are established conventions in terms of how we operate. We already know we have a pattern and a model to follow. Unwritten rules that already the opposition knows, the monarchy knows, and they follow. But if you're new, newly independent, you don't have those written, express, prescribed rules in terms of how do you govern? It is important, therefore, to have your voice and to say, we decided this is how we will govern and move forward. Right? It's, an, it's an important process, therefore, to be part of this because it reflects your authorship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elias Roberts. So what we're going to move on to, now that we've understood some of the fundamental parts of the Constitution, and why it's important for our daily life. Now we're going to discuss the importance of the Constitution. And now I invite the Honorable Justice James to chair that session. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone this morning, um, all protocols having been observed. Um, today, I would like to, to indicate a few uh, comments in relation to uh, the Constitution and the importance thereof, and some considerations for persons who are young persons um, in relation to it. Um, so what is the Constitution? You have just did that exercise, and we have, gathering from what you all have said, it is the founding document of the country, and it's the most important law that you have in the country. It differs from ordinary legislation, as you have indicated, and it's from, with the, from which the different parts of the state get their power, right? which you have indicated. You talked about the fact that it establishes the institutions of government, um, that it clarifies where sovereignty lies in a particular country. That's a, a lot, a big feature that you have indicated, as well as it balances the rights of persons and interests of the majority in where fundamental rights are concerned, and it articulates those core values and commitments that you have indicated. In fact, I think one of the comments was that it defines ourselves as a people, who we are as a people. One that was not necessarily indicated, but one of the importance of a constitution is that it identifies the territory. We wouldn't think that it is as important as it is, but for many countries in the region, what exactly constitutes that country in terms of territory is a very important and quite, could be very um, interesting consideration. All right, um, having worked in Belize, where they're, they're facing issues where Guatemala believes that half of their country is theirs, um, uh, Guyana, where there's some uh, territorial disputes, we can face the same, right? Now, of course, for us, it's about whether or not we include Trinidad and Tobago in the same way as it is, and what exactly our territories, having regard to um, our territorial waters, where Barbados is concerned. So, 
So that is another important feature that you should think about when you are discussing um, the Constitution. As we have indicated, and everyone has so far indicated, the, one of the importance of the Constitution is establishing the various arms of the state. Um, Dr. Roberts has just indicated that there are three main arms of the state, the executive, which is made up of the president, is headed by the president, the cabinet of the country, the public service, the police, um, and all of those persons make up the executive, the legislature, which would be the House of Representatives and the Senate. There is the judiciary, which is headed by the chief justice. Um, there's a court of appeal, uh, there are high courts that is established in the constitution. You may consider whether or not we uh, enshrine magistrates um, and the lower judiciary as a part of uh, the Constitution, but that's a different story, but it establishes those three main arms of the state. In terms of considerations for young persons in relation to those three arms, in terms of the legislature, do we want one parliament system or a presidential system, as you would find elsewhere in the world? Do you want a first past the post system, which we do have now, where it is that we all vote in constituencies, Whoever wins in that constituency wins the entire constituency and whoever wins the most constituency wins. Or do we want a proportional representation electoral system, which is a feature of the Guyanese um, constitution and um, election process where um, there isn't a situation in Trinidad and Tobago where a third party won one third of the votes but had no seats in parliament. Do we wish to then change that system to ensure that everybody who has and all of the country is represented in a, that particular way? Yes, consideration for that. Um, whether we want a single party government, as we may definitely have now, or coalition governments that are featured in certain institutions because of proportional representation, you have to ensure that persons come together and govern for the society in a bipartisan way. Do we want variable election dates, where the election date is in the pockets of any particular prime minister? Do we want to have fixed election dates, as has been in, um, changed in the United Kingdom or elsewhere? Or in the United States, as you would know that the election is a certain day in November every four years. Do we want to have fusion of powers, as we currently do? between the executive and the legislature. As you know, many persons who are in the executive and the cabinet also sits in our legislature and make the laws. Or do we want to separate those parts, the executive and the legislative powers that you may be familiar with with the United States, where it is the executive and the president is head of that executive, but it's all different from who sits in the legislature and Congress. Do we want to have a prime minister who's chosen or president chosen in from the majority of the direct national elections? Or does the legislature choose the president? We want to also, in terms of the civil service and the executive, do we want a neutrality of the civil servants? Or do we want civil service turnover, impartiality, anonymity with political administration? Considerations on importance of those arms of the state and the institutions that it establishes. In relation to the judiciary, how do we see independence of the judiciary as a feature of our constitutions? How can those constitutions impart that in, to ensure that the judiciary is separate and apart from the legislature and or political arm of the states? That it would include how a judge is appointed. Right? Now being a member of the judiciary, and being a member of three judiciaries across the region, all which have different appointment systems, is an important consideration. There are in jurisdictions that um, the, the prime minister determines who is a judge. Do we wish to go to that or have a separate independent commission as it is in Trinidad for the, the appointment of judges? How can judges be removed? An important aspect. Do we want to have instances where judges are on contract? Where it is that at the end of the contract they can be removed? And does that now help with the independence of that judiciary? All aspects for young persons. How long can you serve as a judge? 
should the executive have a role to play, the Prime Minister, in whether or not that judge should be extended? How can you be removed as a judge? <laughs> All very important aspects um, you would see set out in the judicial aspect of a constitution. Of course, as you all have all stated, uh, the con one of the importance of the Constitution is establishing fundamental rights. It protects those fundamental rights and freedoms, um, so it's important to set out what are those fundamental rights and freedoms, as you have indicated. Why do we need them set out in a, a physical document? What are the rights that we do have? And how do we enforce them? It is important for the Bill of Rights because it sets out certain fundamental moral principles. It expresses support for international standards that we too in the Caribbean and in Trinidad and Tobago, no matter where you are, we have a, a set a minimum standard of how we are to be treated as individuals. It also has the importance of consolidating historical gains. The history of our country in terms of slavery in terms of indentured laborship, in terms of uh, uh, marginalization of whether it be black persons or otherwise, sh not mentioned necessarily in our constitution, but what uh, historical gains can be, uh, fundamental rights and freedoms ensures that we not only recognize those historical gains, but we ensure that they never happen again. It helps develop a human rights culture and laws within a country. It provides a way for you to see how to protect your rights, and it gives people the assurance that human rights are secure within a country. As you would have seen in the documents before you, Section 4 mainly sets out the rights in Trinidad and Tobago, of the, fu the fundamental rights. It includes life, liberty, security of the person, you know, uh, equality, the right in... Um, to individual respect for their private and family life, and a number of others that I wouldn't go through. But consideration for you in terms of that important aspect of fundamental rights is what are the rights that are not included? And are those the instances of things that we wish to have be included? The right to human dignity, the right to health, with all matters which affect especially young persons, the right to work and employment, how many, young, which disproportionately affects young persons in terms of employment. The right to education, again, another aspect which disproportionately affects young people. In some jurisdictions, there is a right to up to tertiary education. Trinidad and Tobago is one of the lucky ones where there's a, a right, well, not right to work, but there is a person can have free education up until at least secondary school. In some jurisdictions, that is also not the case and you have to pay. So do you want to enshrine something like that? The right, the express right to vote or run for elections. That is not necessarily set out in writing, although some courts like us have interpreted the Constitution in a way to say that there is this right, but it's not set out there. Do we want to put something there? And the right to run for the election, Again, an aspect that disproportionately affects young person. Does anyone know what is the age requirement to run for elections in Trinidad and Tobago? No, it's not 18, actually. Correct. You have to be at least 25 years old to sit in the Senate, the House of Representatives. But at 18 years, you can vote for any one of those individuals. This is an issue that really arose in in, in Barbados, where it is that the Prime Minister wanted to nominate someone who was um, at the university, he was 18 or 19, to be in the Senate, and they had to have a constitutional reform or a constitutional amendment in order to allow him to sit in the Senate, and it was defeated. So, can you run for election? Who can run for election? What are those requirements? Are also an aspect that may be set out. The right to welfare or social justice, as Dr. Roberts has indicated. Again, matters that affect disproportionately young persons. Poverty and otherwise affect young people disproportionately to be able to do and um, contribute as much in society. 
the right to a healthy environment or sustainable environmental stability or sustainability, another aspect that more affects you than anyone who was before you. Do you actually have a country that you can get? The rising sea levels and climate change affects especially the region more than you think. And so therefore, whether or not you have a right to that and to ensure that the, your leaders ensure that there's sustainability in their development. The right to cultural preservation as young persons. The right to peace and stability, as you can see on your screens daily, how college students are themselves, have their views in one way or the other. How do we wish to have peace and stability in our own country, crime otherwise? How can that be enshrined? So those are some considerations that you would have for fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, the also importance of, of their chapter on fundamental rights and freedoms would be about restrictions on rights, right? No right is absolute, of course, <laughs> but how uh, those rights can be restricted is also important. Trinidad and Tobago doesn't necessarily currently have a limitation clause like some other countries, so that will be a consideration for how it is. So right now it's implied, <laughs> and so therefore how we would like to move forward is uh, important. How do you protect those fundamental rights and freedoms? And the prohibition against challenging um, those fundamental rights and freedoms which are currently in our constitutions, like savings law clauses, which I'm sure you would learn about as much as possible or know more about, which immunizes laws which have been passed way before our constitution that may not be relevant to us now that are, can't be struck down by the courts because even though it's inconsistent with the Constitution, right? For example, there are laws which says that a woman who, um, I suppose, who, who has children can be fired from the police service because the, her family obligations affects her job, which is actually a written rule. Um, can't be challenged because it was passed before the Constitution. Laws which prohibit young persons from being able to participate in different arms of the government. Or that at 35 you can't become, after 35 you can't become a police officer. Or you need to be a certain height. Uh, some of these rules and regulations have been passed way before and as a result the courts are prohibited from doing certain things. All right, um, Constitution, other final words in relation to considerations, especially important, is the kind of language we wish to use in our constitutions. Do we wish to have it plain or be as legal as you think that it is? All right, um, the inclusivity of our constitutions, uh, the approach that we have to masculine and feminine, the fact is, is that many of our constitutions did not even contemplate women. Right? It did not contemplate indigenous individuals. The length of it, right? Um, it does not talk about some, uh, currently about our regional alliances. Right? So when one now is looking at a constitution as from your perspective, who do you wish for this country to be? How do you want this document to define us as a people and what your future to be and protected? Thank you very much. What disqualifies you from becoming a member? Do you think any? Yeah. Um, if you have a mental illness, which is very outdated in my opinion. I'm glad that you said that. Great, all right. So you think mental illness is an outdated disqualification anymore? You cannot file for bankruptcy. Bankruptcy disqualifies you from being a member of parliament. How you all feel about that? Mm. Any others? One more, I'll take one more. You have citizenship, mental illness, bankruptcy, it's section 42 or section 48? 
have a look. I help in Ollie with the quiz, you know. A criminal record. Right, good job. Thank you so much. What's your name? Kieran. Kieran, and I didn't get you. Josiah. Josiah. All right, great. Thanks so much. All right, let's move on to something else. Who can name three commissions established in the Constitution? The Teaching Service Commission, the Public Service Commission, and the um, Judiciary. That's a commission? Mm, you're close. All right, Fana. Oh, wait. Somebody here on this table said something. Police Service Commission. What's your name, sir? Dr. Jelani Reed. Jelani. Thanks so much. Any more? Fana, she took yours. Oh, trats. Anybody else? Any other commissions? There are lots. I'm coming back to you. You have it now? Review commission. Judicial Review Commission. What was what, that? Elections and boundaries. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me hear you. The Judicial and Legal Service Commission. Okay, great. So not the Judicial Review Commission. And what's yours? Elections and boundaries commission. The Elections and Boundaries Commission. Are those prizes? Oh, shucks. Okay. Are they are? Okay. Nice. So then, Chris, which section establishes the EBC? Turn those pages. Which section? Est you're back right on time. Which section establishes the EBC, Shane? Woo. <laughs> you're too far forward. Yes, keep going. Where's Parliament? Well, the cheating. Awesome. 71. Shane, you're on the ball. All right. What's the quorum for the House of Representatives? Is there a quorum for us to sit as House of Representatives and Senate? Right. Anybody knows what the quorum is? No. Cheater, you can't answer anything. 12. For which one? Both? House of Representatives, we have to have 12 members to sit. And what about the Senate? Is it 12 also? You don't think so. What are you thinking? Less than 12? 15? No, you're very wrong. Yeah. 10. Who said 10? All right, Fana, on the ball. So 10 for Senate, 12 for House. Why do you all think we have a quorum, though? That's a general question. It's not in there. Why would we have a quorum for Parliament? You don't want one person there making all the decisions. Right. See? Not all the answers are there written in black and white. Some of them are just common sense, right? Okay, good. All right, next question. Voice. Right. Oh, you all like that one clearly. Freedom of the press. What is that? No, I'm asking you, what is that? The press, um, they have the freedom to share their opinions and their beliefs because, you know, they share what they believe so that the general public knows about what's happening in okay so can i ask you a question in 2024 do we really use that term press anymore even yeah what do you call it now? freedom of speech no. media yeah because times have changed so that's to tell you how old this is and how many things we need to update right you don't really use the word press anymore press was when it was a newspaper press to press down the paper yeah we don't use that terminology anymore any other rights? Come good, eh? Yes, please. The freedom to join a political party. We, twice. Oh, we want another one then. Um, should I use it? Yes, I, I feel so. Freedom of movement. Freedom of movement. What does that mean? You don't know. Oh, okay. Freedom of fun on a Friday, you said that? No, okay. <laughs> oh, thought and expression. Okay, what does that mean to you? You are allowed yeah. to express yourself, your views, regardless of um, 
someone having a contrary view to it or being bound by a law. Okay. So I think is it equal to freedom of speech? Speech? I, I think so. Hmm. I think so. It's a trick question. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. It is. You sure? I am. So can you use obscene language? No. Wouldn't that be freedom? So no. is it an absolute freedom or maybe like a... Uh, yeah, yeah, you're agreeing with me. Yeah. Okay. You're seeing the trick. You're seeing the loophole. Right. right. Okay. So freedom of movement, just an example. So I would think that would have to do with, you know, these issues of, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic and the discussion of having a, um, what's the word? The word slipping me. Um, as well as in 1990, in terms of... Um, Six to six curfew, right. So in terms of freedom of movement, you can move freely throughout the country and no one can bar you from certain, well, any space, of course, there's limitations to that, but you can have freedom of movement anytime, anywhere, and so forth. Just to, yeah. Yeah, so I could decide I don't want to live in Chagones anymore. I want to live in beautiful San Fernando, right. No one could stop me from doing that, unless, of course, we are in some kind of emergency situation where you can't just come to San Fernando just like that. It's declared a zone of some disease. Is it in the Constitution? Does it tell us how we could limit? <laughs> you don't think so? Anytime you hear me ask it a particular way, it's a trick question. Mm -hmm. So can I, I, could, I could take away your rights just like that? It's a national emergency, like a state of emergency, or health um, emergency, or something like that. Um, yes, they can institute provisions to restrict movement. Can I take them away? It is. <laughs> no. Why not? That would be contrary to all the rules and regulations that were put in place before. So it would be unconstitutional to just take them away just like that. There's a process. It's not that you can't. There's a way. You are coming back to you. All right. So, like, if you breach the law and you are placed in um, jail, then, therefore, you, you... So can I walk outside, see you, and take that right away from you just like that? No. Right. There's a process. So in order to interfere with any of those rights, it's not that I could just do that. There's a process for each one. Right? So, yeah. Right. Good stuff. Um, last question. Let's see. Should I pull a hard one? I'll do two hard ones. Is the ombudsman an officer of parliament? No. Pam, yes, you say no already, and I saw you. What's your name? Nafisa. Nafisa. Why you said no? Because it's supposed to be impartial and like not be affiliated with any politics so that you know individuals could have their own say and I'm so glad you said that. So let's look at section ninety one. Oops. So the ombudsman is an officer of parliament. But what's the difference between him being a member of parliament? Which is, ah, it's not the same. Trick question. I'm sorry. I like to trick my um, students. What are the ombudsman's functions while they're there in the FISA? Section 91. Do we know what the ombudsman does? Do we know his role? Have we ever heard about the ombudsman before right now? No, some people, yes, some people. Did I pick on you today, Jeremy? I did? No, but you didn't, he didn't answer any questions. Thank you for reminding me. Section 91. What are, what are the roles of the ombudsman, Jeremy? As a, as a diligent legal professional? Yes. The ombudsman. The ombudsman. <laughs> <laughs>
So, okay, the ombudsman, we may investigate any such matter as it concerns in things. For example, a complaint is made to him by uh, any person that um, has sustained any type of injustice or where a member of the House of Representatives requests that he investigate uh, a matter on the ground that a person or a body of sorts um, specified in request have made or sustained any type of injustice. Have you ever sustained an injustice, Jeremy? Have you ever utilized the office of the Ombudsman for said injustice? Why is that? Because he didn't know the Ombudsman had a constitutional role. Now that you know, yeah. And you could also tell others, yeah? All right, good. Did I say that was the last question? Do you all want to have one more? Oh, you're loving it and having fun. Me too. Let's see. What was the Judicial Review Commission again? What was the Judicial Review Commission's rule again? <laughs> Don't disappoint my fan, huh? Listen to what I asked. What is the Judicial Review Commission? The legal service. Doesn't exist is the answer. <laughs> What's the real, what is the correct name of the commission? The commission and legal service. Yeah, something so, right. But not the Judicial Review Commission. No. Okay, great. All right, back to Kendall. What does that commission do, since you were so interested in it? Oh, you have your own mic, Papa. Mm -hmm. Like, from the top of my head, what I get is the judicial and legal service, because I think um, all the different arms, there should be checks and balances on every particular arm of the thing. I feel like the judicial and legal service um, commission is just to ensure they basically... Um, I guess the legal, the appointment, or like just, not the appointment of judges, but like as a check and balance on the judiciary. Not the appointment of judges? Yes, the appointment yes. of judges. Right. Uh -huh. um, as well as to kind of like um, look at their be, like ensure that they, they follow in the code of conduct of ethical behavior or something like Which that. Which section are you at in the Constitution to understand what the JLSC does. One one zero. You have your own mic, sir. The table has its own mic. I was told. That was just. What is the question? <laughs> Which section in the Constitution establishes the JLSC, and what does it do? Section one ten. Okay. Is it? Yeah, but I don't have a constitution in yeah, my hand. Yeah, one time I Right. Am I? Are you in the right section? I'm not sure. You're, you're, in, you're, you're in regular... You're in, you're in the back. Are we at 10? Uh, yes. Uh, part okay. 2, yes. 110. One, 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 110. One, uh-huh. Yes, please. Establish it. And what does it do? As an up-and-coming legal professional, aspiring... Yeah, and and youth leader. Th I like you. Thank you. And youth leader <laughs> and advocate. Shane so says it's one one. Ah, yes. So Ready. one one. It says here there shall be a judicial and legal service commission for Trinidad and Tobago. The members of the judicial and legal service commission shall be. A, the Chief Justice, who shall be chairman? B, I don't want the membership, sir. Well, well, hold on, hold on. What do they do? Appointments, revocations. Not quite there. I'm listening to you. My ear's small, but I can hear you. No, he, he in the wrong place. What? Oh, yeah, all right, yes, yeah, he has. Yeah. Well, why don't you read it? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, yes. make, they would make appointments to officers of the Solicitor General, Chief Parliamentary Council, mm -hmm. 
Director of Public Prosecutions, Registrar um, General. So it's not just judges, right, Kendall? Or Chief State Solicitor. Interesting. You learn something else today. Right. Yeah, little quiz, right? And you learn a lot. All right, so that was it. I think I, that's time, right, Terry? You have a for me. Uh -huh. If I may. No, no questions for the quiz master. Go ahead. No, no, I'm for real, just no. I just wanted to, if you can share with us the difference between the privileges. Hard question. He going no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. The difference between the privileges committee and the office of the ombudsman. Both. Big difference, two different roles. Yes. So you want me to explain each one because yes. there is no, it, like there is no commonality. There are privileges like in the Committee of Privileges of Parliament. The Committee of Privileges of Parliament is uh, tasked with ensuring that parliamentarians enjoy their privileges and if there's a breach to investigate, a breach of privilege, in a nutshell. The Ombudsman is for the public. The Ombudsman is for you. Privileges Committee is a committee of parliamentarians. So its function is to, within our rules, is to determine rules in relation to privileges. He is. He's not. He's not a parliamentarian. He submits a report to parliament. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I know. Is it something that you think should be changed, though? The function of the ombudsman's office, maybe something that, because if it's causing some disquiet in your mind. No, no, I don't think it should be. I wouldn't want to comment on that because okay. I don't know enough. Enough to see, because I, one of the things and the challenges with some of the sections in the Constitution, I mean, these are the young people, but I don't think adults know some of the functions of the what we have in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So to comment and have a position to say that I don't want it or I want it, then that, that wouldn't be fair. So it's something to become familiar with. Correct, yes. And maybe it's a, an office that's underutilized because people aren't familiar with what it does. Because it's in, we see people on TV talking every day about injustice, right? I feel like it needs, um, similarly to the um, PCA, the, is it PCA, the Police Complaints Authority, mm -hmm. while it, it makes recommendations and all these things, I feel like it should get more teeth, it should be able to, um, you know, more, it should, it should get some more powers than basically. So and to give it more powers. Not just make recommendations. But in order to, to know if it needs more powers, you have to know the powers that it, you know, powers that I have, you think I have, and the powers that you think I have, I don't, remember that? Right, so in order to know if it needs more, you have to be familiar with what it does and what its powers are. All right, that's the end of the quiz. Thank you so much for engaging. Did I pick on everybody? No. Next time. Yeah, you point. She's not looking at me at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Terry, where are you? Okay, thank you so much, Ms. LaRoche, for that engaging session. So everything that we did in that quiz was for a purpose. So now we get to the practical part of the exercise where I now invite Mr. Chris Hossein as well as Mr. Kiel Taklal Singh. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, but I invite you, right? Kiel, I said it wrong all the way through. Feel free to reintroduce yourself. Mm, too. Right? Yes. All right, everyone. So, uh, good morning as well to each and every one of you all. I know that this has been a very interesting morning. We have listened to a number of presentations so far. I'm moving away from you because I think we're getting some feedback. Okay, good. Right? So, for this particular part of the activity today, which is what I think most of us would have gotten here for, would have been to give our um, perspectives on this reform exercise here. And so you all are already in groups right now. I think we have, I think, one person in that table over there. So maybe if you can find, yes? Two other persons. Okay, great. So we're going to allow each table to discuss amongst yourself um, what you think or what you would like to see in the reform conversation. 
and we're going to give you all about, about maybe 10 minutes to discuss, and then each person from each table will then give a summary of what the um, discussion sounded like amongst the table. Yes, one person per table. So, so we'll allow that for a little 10 minutes. So for, so for this particular portion, 10 minutes, each table is going to dis discuss amongst themselves the recommendations that they would like to present to the advisory committee, who is here to, of course, discuss the reform with us. Right. So, so I've just been asked to remind everybody that you don't have to be too legalese. You don't have to draft statute. You don't have to come up with the next Bill of Rights. And let me, let me just tell you one thing. You have the chance today with a blank canvas. You have to think about it like that. Don't take on the ills and the baggage of previous generations. My recommendation to you is to look at what are the problems that you confront as young people? Think about what are the problems that you want your constitution, which essentially is the document that will govern and guide your future and your relations with each other, your relations with the state. Think about the future. One, someone I was speaking to a young person, and you could think while we talk, I was speaking to a young person just the other day, and he was telling me, why shouldn't the constitution deal with artificial intelligence? What about your right to humanity? One day you may have to compete in employment with an AI program or a robot. These are things that you all have to think about. What about freedom of expression? Recently, the Caribbean Court of Justice in a case called McQueen ruled and overruled and overturned a cross-dressing law and said that that was um, unconstitutional because it violated freedom of expression. Those are all important issues that you have to address. So you have to think about what are the questions and problems that you will likely face. One of the other things that came into the public domain recently was a, a defamation judgment against a Calypsonian. I won't sing the Calypso, but Calypso is an indigenous form of expression. Should we protect it in our constitution? I don't know. You all can answer the questions. There's another discussion about firearms and ammunition. In America, there's a right to bear arms. Do we also want a right to bear arms in Trinidad and Tobago to protect your property and your life? These are questions that you have to confront and discuss as young people and come up with the solutions and make the recommendations to this committee because you are now a part of history. Your recommendations will go down in this committee's deliberations. Whether it finds its way in its final recommendations or not is important. But the point is you have the right to participate in a true democracy. I also listened to one of the presenters this morning, and he spoke about the Senate, and Ms. Um, Chantal would have also discussed the age limit, or I believe the, the minimum age to serve in the Senate. And so that is 25 years, and that is something as young persons. We need to look at that, because we all know a number of young professionals and young people who would like to contribute at that particular stage? And should 25 years be the, the age to, to which uh, uh, um, a senator can now start contributing? I'm, I'm sure a number of us here. How many persons here are below 25 years? I, I believe you, Kyle. <laughs> I believe you. I feel I identify as under 25. You ide I, love that. I love that. I love that. And also, I, I believe in the lower house, it is 18 years in which you are allowed to put yourself forward for a general election. But and Chris, so but yes. Chris, before you go on, yeah. why should they also not consider whether we need a Senate? There are many, you have a system that's called a bicameral system, you have two houses. How many of you have looked at the Senate in Parliament and it's like, what I'm talking about, boy, didn't they just discuss it in Parliament, in the House? Do we need two houses of Parliament? What is the role of the Senate? Think about it. Do we need to discuss things twice? Should we have a should we have like an American system where you have a president and an exec with executive powers? These are all the important questions that you have to think about using your experience. And as I said, you don't have to get into the nitty gritty, but your recommendations should form, you know, thoughts, ideas that I'm sure the committee could take into account and actualize for you. When, when I um, reflected on the age limit or the minimum age limit to serve in the Senate, 
it also got me thinking about, well, what is the maximum age limit? And I think that is something that we also need to discuss because when we speak about taking the country forward, we need our policy makers to be able to understand the generational differences and the generations to come because a number of us here are part of generation um, Z, right? And some of us are millennials. And so that too is something that we need to discuss because, and we'll have this discussion, frankly, as a youth, and I'm saying this as a, as a, as a youth advocate in this country, some of the conversations in which we hear from our um, politicians does, does not augur well with our generation in how we would like to have a productive conversation about how AI will impact the labor force, climate change, and those kind of conversations. So maybe an age maximum is something that we need to look Okay, so I think we should be wrapping up. I'm sure that the commission will entertain some late submissions if necessary. Um, so which table wants to start? Should we, we have recommendations from here? Chris, I'll start here. Okay. You start there? And, and, uh, yes. <laughs> A young at heart gentleman. Oh, oh in front. Well, see, well, let's, okay, let's start. We're going to start here. And they want you to front the camera, right? Let's face the camera. Looks like we have a Magna Carta come in here. Listen, I, I, no, listen to me. I saw them, had, they had three pages. I think they think they're gonna win something. I think it's a competition. It's a prize. Can we just, when you're okay, look on a photo with, your, with the signs that I have never seen, right? So I see one header, crime and justice, let's see. Okay, so good afternoon everybody. My name is Fana Nelson and my team member here is Daniel Sukdeo. Daniel Sukdeo and we've got a lot of support from Ms. Jackie. Thank you so much for your assistance on this specific project. Um, so we'll start off by speaking on the heading of crime and justice as you all know constitutional reform is important and we would like our voices to be heard and we want to see some changes as we go forward for our country and for all of us in this room here today. Um, so our first point is on the right to quality and equitable education, inclusive of special education for differently abled persons. Um, the right to a speedy trial, as we know, our trials in Toronto today will take many years. So we have a couple of five years for trials to be completed. A right to a political preference without discrimination. And I can speak from experience um, in many organizations that I've worked in on those specific um, forms they ask you about your political preference. And if you take yes to that specific preference, there can be discrimination or no employment for you at that organization. This is in the private, private sectors. This is, a, this is a big one for me as well. The right to self-defense. Um, this is also one from my table for both the males and the females. We understand how things are going in our country. So we want to have some level of self-defense to protect us in our homes, our vehicles, in public spaces. The right to quality health services, inclusive of mental health. We still shun our eyes on the topic of mental health in Trinidad and Tobago. So we want to put this at the forefront to get some change happening here. The right to sustainable environment and natural resources. The right to state housing should be administered in a transparent, fair, and equitable manner for every citizen in Trinidad and Tobago. The right, to, the right of choice of sexual orientation. This is a big one for us as well, so we want to have some level of change and reform happening here. Um, all social services, inclusive of food, water, shelter, should be administered in a transparent, fair and equitable manner as well. Basic necessities of life, not everybody else was basic necessities of life. Right? Thank you. Our next page. So we're going to talk about the topic of service commission here. Service Commission should fill vacancies within one year. Let's give, them, give a specific example. Teaching, teaching service. People are waiting many years to be called for, to be a teacher, and they have the teacher's numbers within three to six months, but they can't get a job within five, ten years to still waiting to be a teacher. So we want to see some change happening here. Um, publish codes for the commissions functioning to eliminate 
nepotism, and I stress again, nepotism, favoritism, and the process should be transparent. Commission should be responsive to applicants. We don't get responsive to these applicants at all. Yeah? Um, other bodies, state should do all in its power to promote efficiency and effective operations of independency bodies and to keep them accountable. I want my team member to speak on this specific point here. Yeah, so we do recognize that there's a lot of uh, organizations that are currently doing a lot of great work in the country, whether it be the EMA um, or whatever other bodies. That, that's the one that comes to mind. Uh, but there may be limits, there may be barriers to them carrying out their duties. And uh, in as far as possible, we would like to see those barriers to these other bodies uh, performing their functions be re reduced and minimized. Right? So that's what we meant there by the other bodies. Uh, in terms of the citizens' duties to the state, we know that there's a lot of brain drain that may be happening for various reasons. Persons are getting their education uh, covered, but then there may not be jobs available. So there is a form of this already, but we'd like to see that where the state has paid for uh, a person's education, that there be included that, you know, that, that amount of uh, mandatory service back to the state. In as much as is possible. Yeah. So we know also that not everyone will be uh, academically inclined. So when it comes to the right to education, we want to, to see that alternative educational opportunities, whether that be te uh, through technical skills, uh, other certifications and qualifications, that those opportunities be provided for all uh, citizens. So then there's also uh, checks and balances across the board. Now, in terms of who watches the, the watchman, who guards those who, who, who guard against us, those who hold positions of power and authority, uh, we want to see in a, that there are measures in place that hold these persons accountable and that a lot of transparency uh, is involved. And then, finally, we have that all children must be afforded safety to grow into productive citizens. And I know that my colleague has some, a little more to say on that. Yes, so this was a very passionate point for me as well, where all children must be afforded to safety. Uh, many of us know persons, but it's in our communities, persons, some organizations, who they are um, involved in abuse of all different forms in their homes, persons who live in rural areas as well in Trinidad and Tobago. And we are aware that the children's authority also need to step up a bit on this to understand what's happening in those communities and pay attention to our children because the children are our future. So if we don't take care of them from young, how they can they now become productive citizens and trans Tobago? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Brianna Atwell, and I'm presenting with Mr. Jeremy. So I want to introduce you all to Billy. This is Billy. <laughs> Billy is a young adult who lives in the Caribbean. And this is what Billy has to say. That the age limit should remain for this um, position of senator for 25 years old. As we know in science is that at 25 years old, the brain is fully developed. Let us move on. That there should be an implementation and recognition of a national youth council. There is multiple youth councils that exist in Trinidad and Tobago but we think there should be one, in unity, one body, moving together to achieve progress, etc. But it's not just a youth council, but it's like a nationalized one, in which the government would recognize and also play a vital role in. We should, right, for JLSC to have autonomy over their staff resources. I can't say the blunt vision, but I won't. For a section to be added pertaining to the environmental protection, whether it be for laws pertaining to species that may be endangered, etc., but also for littering. A question was asked on my table and it stated, when last was someone charged for littering? I live in a rural area and I see littering very often and I live near the sea also. So it's very important for us as Trinidadians that we should work on that. And this is not just specific, this is for future gen generations, right? Because the Constitution is not just all for this current issue, but once more, the future.
for the first words of the Constitution to be changed. Whereas, it's not going to cut it. We, as the people of Trinidad and Tobago, this is what we have to say. This is now our Constitution. The right to recall an MP, whether they be ineffective in their service or not, simply doing their roles and responsibilities, that we should have authority and power, not just one person to revoke, but as a community, voices to be heard. That we want change, and for the change to happen, if this must occur, then it must happen. For, the, for there to be a term limit for office holders, and that would be for two terms. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Are we good? Okay, so we'll have our last group. I say it's the president, very honorable president of the Trinidad Youth Council. So we had a very lively discussion at our table. Shane John, Aaron, and Anarian and myself. Yes. We discussed education, whether there should be a right to free education. There is a discussion about whether it should be at primary, secondary, and tertiary. And we agreed on primary and secondary. We talked about speedy trial. We didn't agree on what that means, but we felt that <laughs> there's a lot of backlog of cases in the system and there should be this right enshrined and later to be determined what we mean by a speedy trial. We also talked about the right to a clean and healthy environment in the Constitution, that that should be included protection of natural resources. We heard other groups talk about endangered species and so on. So if that is to be expanded, that could be determined later. But at least some right and recognition that the environment is very important. We think it should be in the law that is a constituent document that is the supreme law of the land. We also talked about anti-discriminatory laws that should encompass areas like sexual orientation, gender identity, disabilities, that we know that there are some laws on the books that are discriminatory. So this may be beyond constitutional reform and a review of several other pieces of legislation that would have to be amended to be in conformity with that. You can see. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say the, that we were discussing and we realized that we weren't necessarily discussing to put things on paper. So I must share that we had a submission um, written by our colleague and he had his point, so we worked from his working document, right? And so it triggered conversations and so forth. So I'm going to touch on the other things that we focused on. In terms of youth representation, and I mentioned it when I opened earlier on, that there should be a National Youth Council mentioned in the Constitution that speaks to the National Youth Council given representation and recommendation to ministries as it pertains to youth and youth policy, as well as when you look at the National Youth Council, that Youth Council will be responsible for submitting and representing young people as it relates to statutory boards. Um, so what the Constitution speaks to now is that you have boards, statutory boards, where most boards there needs to be a representative from the THA, and then there's representatives of civil society, and therefore there now should be recommendations coming from your National Youth Council that would be responsible for selecting young people under the age of 35 that are efficient, proficient, and as well educated in whatever field to serve on your statutory board across ministries. That is number five. Number six, 
limited number of ministries. And this was a contentious conversation, and we just mentioned, and the touch of when administrations change, you have a change in uh, ministries. And sometimes simple things like ministries, name change, and so forth. And you talk, we spoke about how expensive that is. Um, so the suggestion was made um, by the goodly gentleman, and he said he would be sharing his shirt with me, because I didn't I need to get that, that shirt plug as an excellent. But we spoke about the US, and the US having a fixed number of ministries. Um, of course, we don't know how much, but we know for sure that they have a fixed number of ministries. And what we are recommending is 20 ministries. Right now, the Constitution speaks to a cabinet having a prime minister and your attorney general. And that is your cabinet. And it doesn't speak to any other specific ministry. And what we also suggested, that within every 10-year period, those ministries, those 20 ministries that are suggested, should be debated in Parliament if whether or not they should be changed or not, and if there's need for addition or so forth. Yes, I can talk about replacing the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. We also discussed that, and I felt that it was time that we replace what I believe is a colonial relic of the past with our own system. If you truly understand how judges are appointed, the tenure, the system of the trust fund, the independence of the system, the importance of having an indigenous auto jurisprudence in the region, then you will support this. And also there is a lot of confidence in that system. I once heard that uh, private investors or foreign investment might stop if you replace, but there's never been any study to document that. And further, with a lot of major investments, they, those contracts have arbitration, international arbitration, and not the local system. So I don't see some of the justifications that are out there making sense and having any merit in terms of replacing the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. There's a treaty in place for that. The building is based here in Trinidad, in Henry Street in Port of Spain. Promises were made, and it's time that, you know, they should be acted upon. Yeah. And then we went to discussions on the president, and we have the view that we should maintain the role of the president. Um, and, well, Dean, she is from Guyana, and they come, so I shared with the table, and we started discussing, you know, the role of the president, and the, there is, in the 2013 submission um, by the then committee for constitution reform, it spoke to um, looking at the possibility of our president being an executive pre president, one that sits in the parliament, and the suggestion that was referenced is the Guyana, Guyana situation. And so when you look at it and you examine it, you have your president, who is an executive president, i.e. the prime minister. And then you have your prime minister in Guyana, who is the leader of the house in Trinidad and Tobago. And because of political indifference, that's the best way to put it, you now have a vice president who was also the, prime, the president of Guyana at some point in time. And you understand the political um, issues and ins and outs between that conversation. So therefore, in reality, Guyana and Trinidad has a similar situation where they actually have a prime minister and a leader of the house in Guyana, but it's just at a different name. So therefore, we believe because of the importance of the office of the president to hold the legislative um, in terms of calling elections and so forth, we said that because of the, in the issues and the challenges that Guyana experiences every time that there's an election, it is important for us to have an independent office of the president. We didn't get into the discussion whether or not we think the president should be elected by the, the population, but all in all, we think the current structure of the, pre the office of the president in Trinidad should stay. 
right? And it may mean that we need to educate our population a bit more of the importance of the office of the president because we can run into similar situations where there is no overarching um, authority over the prime minister in Trinidad. Um, number nine, the provision for referendums. Uh, this is very simple. Local government and the issue that went to the Privy Council, that was Rule 3.2 in terms of the extension by the government, in terms of uh, local government, calling of the local government election. We believe when we look at the issue of referendums, there needs to be, and the society needs to be a bit more engaged as it relates to certain issues, and therefore the Constitution should speak to those issues where the country should vote on certain matters, All right? Of course, my, I can say my friend now, spoke to, you know, where, how constitution law and how law is very interesting and there are the blurred lines so that it's a very contentious issue. Yeah, that sometimes the judiciary might interpret um, certain provisions that have been interlocking with others yeah. and where the provision might indicate that this is not required, the courts might say, oh, but it's so linked to the other provision that has a, it's more deeply entrenched that that could happen. So you have to be very careful how you use that type of provision. Yeah. Service Commission, I know I've been speaking for a while, but two tables mentioned the Service Commission. One, I think, one, we spoke about the movement, the movement away from promotion, the issue of promotion, and there needs to be a revisiting of that exercise in the service permission based on promotion and appointments and so forth. And as well, number 11, in closing, we said that we believe that the age to be a part of the Senate should be 18 years understanding that the voting age of our population is 18 years, as well as a member of the House of Representatives um, can be under the age of 25. Therefore, we believe it should be in the same line as uh, the voting population. So we want to go quickly to this second group. Yes. So we just need one or two, or if the entire group would like to present, that's fine. Okay, sure. Hi, plus and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kiron, and we'll pre be presenting on our constitutional reform. So, the first one we'd look at would be make restorative justice mandatory. So, in this way, prisoners won't live for free anymore. They would actually give back to society and even of the so that they could even off the um, socio econ economy sorry the other one would have um, make the switch from JC um, hi I'm Josiah Adolphus and to continue we were talking about making the switch from the Privy Council to the Caribbean Court of Justice because why are we relying on foreign people and outsiders to make decisions on our internal issues. It, that makes, it makes no sense, but so yes, then I'll create a youth council for youth opinion. So in creating a youth council, we could probably have more younger brains on the table, right? Um, yes, the elders play a crucial part in society, however, society is evolving and the only way elders are evolving is on their way out. So while we transition, it's the truth, it's the truth, it's the truth, it's the harsh truth. So we want to transition from 
not just having our elderly leadership, but more youthful leaders. Um, on that note, we would like to also make mention that government officials should relinquish their title roles as ministers once they reach the age of 65. They can remain as advisory. <laughs> they can remain as, as advisors because the young people, we know, but we don't know everything. So they could advise us, but instead of keeping our role for 10 more years when you're done getting pension, no. I find... <laughs> We discussed that, they sh that the young people should be given their time. Once they reach 25, you know, you decide, right, 25, you decide, I want to be a part of this, I want to be a part of the House of Representatives. You reach there. Why are we letting the older people take longer instead of giving our children the time to get accustomed in their roles and make better decisions? And then... Right, and then um, and then this one has to do with mental illness because when we were looking at the reasons for not accepting someone into the House of Representatives, one of the criteria was the, once they have a mental illness, they cannot be considered to be part of the House of Representatives, which I, we see was very outdated because once a person is qualified and seen as a fit and proper individual, their mental illness should not have higher precedent for them not joining the House of Representatives because many mentally ill persons still have a large, they have large ideas, they have things that they can contribute to society. So why them being mentally ill, having depression, having anxiety should impact their role to help the, the community and help the country? And the last and final one would be um, remove savings law clause. So in this way, we will no longer be protecting the endangered species. Thank you. Okay, so we want to thank you all and we want to move on to this young lady who would have worked, I think, by yourself? No. With a group? Okay, great. So you're going to present us as well. Yeah. So you mentioned just now about mental health, right, and mental Ill illness, and how they should possibly be committed and not restricted, etc. Like, are you being specific, like depression, like anxiety, or like, what if someone is like schizophrenic? Like, what happened there? Is it like all mental illnesses should be accepted, or are you gonna put like a limit or specify on like? As we said, once the person is seen as fit to fulfill the role, whether they have depression, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder. Once they are seen as fit, they should have the opportunity because they're not going to be fit just, you know, strong. No, once they are mentally fit to take on the role, to make decisions, they should not be hindered from doing so. Okay, we have someone here. Um, but how, will you, can, how can you tell if the person is mentally fit because anxiety is something that happens. It happens at any point in time, depression as well. You can be good today and then by two days later, you go into a different set of emotions, feeling all different types of things in your body. So how can you really say that the person is mentally fit on that regard? Well, that's the thing. We, have, we live in Trinidad. We have plenty of therapists. We have plenty of psychiatrists who can... Who can take part in seeing if the person is mentally fit because they have the equipment they have studied years to see in this i just know that today there's therapy there is antidepressants there are so many things which can help people who are mentally ill become you know better so why should we prevent them from being a part of making decisions just because they have it just to just to add to the conversation um in law you have tests that are developed to determine if someone is incapable of performing a function because of mental illness. You have the McNaughton test in common law, and then you also have the Mental Health Act where you can actually apply to court. So if you have a sick relative, for instance, um, who is incapable of administering their own bank accounts, etc., you can go to court and a referee is appointed, not a football referee, but a medical referee, to give a psychiatric evaluation, and that determines if they are incapable of administering their own affairs. So, but I do think I am someone who thinks that the Mental Health Act 
needs updating. It might not be a strictly constitutional issue, but certainly a legislative one. Good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the committee for being here in San Fernando today to give us an opportunity to express ourselves in terms of this constitutional reform. I don't think the society as a whole in Trinidad has a more laid-back society. People doesn't understand the importance of lending their voices to this constitutional reform. You know, and one of those issues are because, and I'd like to make it clear that my group were participants Mickey Matthews and Mr. Johnny Musgraves made some very valid points here. So, one of the points were, today was actually the first time I got a chance to take a look at this book. And that, I think, is the beginning of most of the problems here, right? If everyone would have had the opportunity to know the importance that contains in this book, then they would understand and recognize the value of being here today. So there, be, there lies the beginning of the problem. Constitution should be taught in secondary schools. And I think that point there deserves a round of applause. Because I went to school and nowhere were we ever thought of the importance and the value. If, people, if the youths would understand that, more of them would fill this room with this youth council today and lend their voices. Because whatever is going to impact the decisions here are going to impact on the youths and the future generations. Right? So therefore, one of the changes that should be made that this should be necessarily taught and compulsory taught in secondary schools, right? Another point here, made by Mr. Matthews, he believes the death penalty should be addressed and look into more closely to kind of deter hard, harsh um, penalties for cold-blooded killers and really harsh crimes. You should look at the death penalty. And Mr. Matthews, Mr. Musgraves also made the point that having the marijuana trees at home kind of should be deterred, you know, have it at a more facility to be controlled, right? Another point made by Mr. Matthews here, right? The constitutional reform in the hands of the youths is a poison chalice, as he made the point very clear because it is not constructed for the youths with the youths in mind. That is why we need to have the voices of the youths here present to make their point heard and known, right? One of the points I would like to address now, there's a lot of issue in terms of age restrictions. The matter was brought up today where it was clear that senators, there's an age constraint of 25 years old for the senators. Youths now are vibrant. They are educated. They are empowered now. We need to get out here and be heard. Look at this table. Look at the bright young faces. There's a wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm and passion comes from the youth. You have to allow them an opportunity to be heard. So that needs to be changed in the Constitution. The 25-year age limit, that could go down to 18. You know, once somebody expresses their interest and they show the competency, because I'm quite sure you're not going to allow anybody into parliament. They would have strict biometric tests and so on to go through. And then they would have the qualifications and so on. Once somebody demonstrates the capability, allow them to participate and be part of parliament. And so goes for the age limit restrictions in terms of, in terms of how old you could be also. Recently, I applied for a program and I was told that I was too old. God knows how. Right? So... The passion and the enthusiasm expressed by some people willing to be part of programs, it should be acted upon and allow them to act upon those positions and those instances where the passion really flows and then they'll get much more out of them. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add to the discussion there um, for the edification of the young people. We had one suggestion by one table to abolish the savings law clause. And then we seem to have another suggestion which is advancing the death penalty for serious crimes. So one of the things you'll have to think about as you consider and debate is that if you 
abolish the savings law clause, it is quite likely that the death penalty will now be held unconstitutional because one of the laws that is protected pre-1976 is the death penalty. So that is something you'll have to think about in your debates as you have these discussions. And I heard the discussion about a national youth assembly and council. And what I think is a wise this, um, point, what is interesting is that we are having several conversations. I didn't only hear it today here, I heard it at several other consultations that we need to almost do the job of some MPs and ministers. And I think it is in a space where they are to represent our views. The, 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 you know, the, the view of the member of parliament when they get to that house is to represent our views. And so they have to consult with us. And so if it is that they are inefficient in representing the youth or the elderly or the, 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 the persons who may have issues with, with um, you know, special needs and that kind of thing, then we have an issue. And so the right to recall your MP, I think, is a, is a good point, and I think it's something that we need to look at a bit more. Um, age limits. I think age limits is another thing that we need to look at. I said earlier on, we have a minimum age in the lower house at 18 years, and so for the Senate, I'm also proposing 18 years still. And the reason why, because I heard the discussion that, well, they may not be fit enough but the appointment of a senator is not something that is always permanent, right? Those, and I think the table over here would have agreed with 18. Because there are certain pieces of bills or, or motions that may become before the um, upper house that may require a younger perspective. I know right now we have a Ministry of Digital Transformation, we have a Ministry of um, Youth Development and National Services, we have discussions surrounding GATE, we have discussions surrounding OJT, we have discussions surrounding CXC, SEA, and those kind of perspectives must come from, I think, the persons interested or, 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 or has a vested interest in that they may have to apply to a university, and so the arrangement with GATE may affect them. And to get that perspective, maybe what we can see is the opposition or even the government temporary appoint maybe a UE Gill president to represent a view there. I, I apologize. To represent a view there in that particular forum. So I think it's not something that has to be permanent. It can be something that we could, you know, digest and entertain a bit more. Um, I am also looking at, I think, I, think that, I think I covered it all very quickly. <laughs> so I want to ask you, Kyle, right? We have to move apart. Of course, yes. I think we have to move apart, yes, but we have to move um, apart. I'm not going to add, I think you've summarized some of the major points. I think thematically, what we heard today from the youth, if you were to summarize it, they want more accountability from all sectors of society, including parliamentarians, service commissions, institutions. They obviously want more transparency in the way things are done. And you also hear a cry, participation. They want to participate in decision making. And I think that's an important issue. Um, clearly, I mean, I, I am on the public, not to close on this note, I am on the public record as being a supporter of the Privy Council. I think I'll take up um, the doctor and Mr. Farrell on those points in private. But um, that is my view on that issue. Um, and I could, it's only left to me, I know there's a voter, thanks. But as a lawyer, I've always believed that it is important that we educate the population on law, the rule of law, and the decisions that they have to make. And I really want to thank you, the committee, for engaging young people in such a robust discussion. And I think that's important. I think we have a gentleman who wants to make a contribution. Chris, can, yes. we, can we give him a short one? We always have... Good day to everybody, and um, it, it's great. It's, you know, the young people of our country is great. It is great, and, and I thank God for all the, the head table, everybody. And I think we have a wonderful nation. I always think so. My name is Mr. Johnny Musgrave, right? I'm more on the Christian side, pre a preacher, but I'm very, very concerned about this nation. I, from Grandy, I came down here, and I'll be going to other consultation to listen, to hear what is happening in our country because I understand the importance of constitution. But however, I was on the table here when I heard the young judge there explaining certain things, I realized by it, boy, you taught you know plenty of things, boy, but you know, you know, you understand? And then this gentleman here spoke certain things. 
And I realize in that um, I, I, I would want to advise that we take our time and give this constitution reform business some time. Because we need to understand better about it. We have not been taught about it, and we need to give it some time. Um, uh, and, and also the method of advertising constitution reform exercises, the method. I don't think it's working because, um, let's, let me be reasonable. I'm a realist, right? How much youth we have here? Right? Right? About 20? That doesn't, it, if, if, if they was to choose based on, in every community, on this, what we have in here, we would not be getting what we want because you're using constitution, you're using the consultation, right, to get suggestions for the, for the reform. reform. If the, if the, um, re, the, 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 um, advertisement. Um, excuse, excuse me, sir. So w we have a little issue right now. We would have uh, been carded for the event to go until 1.30. All right, so I'm finishing now, no. Yes, yes, yes. So, no, no. Yes. Give, give me 30 seconds. 30 seconds. And I'm done. Thank you. So if the method that you're using to advertise does not bring out the people, how could it be, how, how could you get what you want? So I am saying that this, yeah, we have everything to tops here, but it would be a failure. I'm saying that. But we thank you for your contribution. Of course, if anyone else, yes, like to contribute, I know the questions. So now we will have, I believe, a representative from the TYC, the first vice president. Yes. Yes, okay. Ms. Terry Ann Baker. She'll give us the vote of that. Yes, I know I didn't say this earlier, but... Chris here is a former National Youth Parliamentarian, so it's good that he was able to chair this session along with Kyle, because I don't want to get the last name incorrect. Thank you for that. So right before we close, and I thank you all so much for taking time out to attend, I'll just have Shane John deliver some closing.